for income one way or another in the midst of confinement. So the Serb was there for when the economy was completely shut down and we wanted the economy to be shut down in order to protect people's health. But at the same time, now as the economy starts up again and as people return to work by remaining vigilant and being careful, of course, there will be a lot of people who will be going off the Serb to benefit from the wage subsidy instead or simply go back to their job. So as the situation evolves, there will be fewer and fewer people who will need the CERB, and therefore we will be making changes to the system. But the system is uh, operating step by step uh, in the right way. Uh, Prime Minister, BNN Bloomberg is reporting this morning that finance officials are preparing to deliver a fiscal update sometime this summer. Uh, your government didn't deliver a federal budget this spring, um, and Canadians don't really have a clear picture of where the government finances are. Will you commit to delivering either a budget or a fiscal update before Labor Day? Uh, we have been open and transparent every step of the way about our investments, about uh, the measures we're taking to support Canadians. Uh, we've been presenting regularly at Finance Committee, all of our uh, expenditures. We've been debating measures in the House. We've been taking questions from media, from uh, opposition parties every step of the way because transparency during a time of crisis is extremely important. And we will continue uh, to look for ways uh, to share with Canadians what we're doing, how we're helping them, and uh, what, uh, what kind of fiscal frame we find ourselves in. The challenge with any fiscal update is as the economy starts up again, it's very difficult to know what that will look like. We can certainly have a range of projections that will vary widely depending on you know, how uh, many businesses reopen and to what percentage. Are restaurants going to be half full? Are, are they going to rehire? Are they going to shut down and go bankrupt? Uh, are uh, people going to start going out again and shopping? Are they going to uh, you know, hunker down for the summer in their, in their cabins or at home and, and not go out. I mean, there are so many things that we simply don't know that making projections about what our economy could look like six months from now or a year from now uh, would be an exercise in, uh, in invention and imagination. Obviously, we need to continue to be transparent and concrete about everything we're doing and uh, forecast what kind of expenditures we're going to have in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but a proper fiscal update uh, is something that, that you know, includes usually projections on three to five years in the future that we simply don't know about. The Parliamentary Budget Officer has produced a uh, deficit projection of $260 billion. I don't think that's, he would consider that invention or imagination. Um, but regardless of what that figure is exactly, future governments are going to have to carry that debt. The servicing costs on that are going to be very high. Sorry? The, the servicing costs on the debt that you're going to have to carry, that you're, you're adding to now, right? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Uh, okay, but it's still a lot of money. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's still a lot yeah, of money. No, no. It, and, and you don't know where... The, okay, so, so, so but, but how, how are you going to pay for that? How okay. are you going to pay for those costs in, in future years? Are you going to increase taxes or are you going to uh, cut programs? Okay. Right now, we're in an absolutely unprecedented situation where our economy had to completely shut down. And the government chose to and needed to be there for people while they lost their paychecks, while uh, they could not uh, you know, be comfortable in how they were going to be able to support their families, pay their rent, pay for their groceries. We put forward measures to support Canadians right across the country so that we could stay healthy and so that we could have an economy to come back to as soon as the opportunity arose. We have been absolutely transparent every step of the way about these investments we're making for Canadians, about how we are supporting millions of Canadians, millions of, of people, thousands upon thousands of small businesses across this country get through this unprecedented time. Canada went into this crisis with a far better fiscal position than just about any other G7 country, and uh, we are coming through it extremely well as well. The investments we're making that will allow Canada to bounce back strongly from this 
uh, are the kinds of things that we needed to do during this pandemic. And as we move forward, uh, because of historically low interest rates, the debt servicing costs will be low. But we will need to uh, look very carefully at how we, uh, we uh, remain fiscally responsible as we move forward. But the best thing to focus on is ensuring that Canadians can come back from this strongly, that they can get back to work, that they can reopen their stores and their businesses, that they have confidence once again in our economy and our future. And those are the things that we need to do, needed to do in the short term in order for us to have a long term for our Canadian economy. We were facing an unprecedented crisis where thousands of Canadians were in a situation where they no longer had any income, they no longer had a paycheck to buy groceries or pay their rent or care for their family. We had a duty as a government and we made the choice of helping them because in order to get through this crisis, this health crisis so that we could eventually bounce back very strongly when the crisis was over, we needed to make immediate investments to help Canadians. And the best way of having a healthy economy in the coming years was to ensure that people could get through the crisis, they could hang on, and that's exactly what this government decided to do. With historically low interest rates now, uh, the fact that the government decided to help Canadians as we did, well, that was the best way of minimizing the consequences and the costs of these measures for uh, years and decades to come. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. At the end of the 16-week period for the CERB, a, a lot of people will um, fall into a vacuum. They won't have access to the wage subsidy, they won't know what to do, and they won't have a job. What can you say to to those people who are feeling tremendous uncertainty now, they don't know what the transition will be. Perhaps you could explain to them what measures you are considering now. Would it be a more targeted and flexible CERB? Would it be the return to an employment insurance program? Could you give us some indications, please? From the very beginning, we have said, as a government, that we would be there for people, that we would there be there to support them. We created the CERB to help thousands of Canadians who had lost their jobs. And even if the economy is starting to reopen now, we are fully aware of the fact that not all jobs will be coming back right now. People will continue to need help, and we will be making announcements in the coming days that will explain exactly how we're going to help them, but I can reassure people right away that as a government, we will continue to be there to help you, to support you in the midst of this crisis. Now, on the question of fraud, will there be additional staff brought in to do those checks, and who will do them? Because if you're announcing penalties such as this, uh, I mean, that may be a bit of a smokescreen if there's no one there to, you know, actually apply them. Well, from the very beginning, we introduced uh, new staffing and brought in new staff in order to, able, to be able to get that money out the door and apply the CERB the way it was supposed to be applied. We have been working with an extraordinary public service that has done an outstanding job right across the country in delivering these programs to ensure that the integrity, integrity of the uh, program would be maintained and that there would be consequences for anyone trying to deliberately defraud fraud the system. Good morning. You, you as a government, you talk about being transparent, you talk about using evidence to guide your policy make, uh, decisions. What evidence do you now have, what analysis have you done to look at wh why people are not transferring from the CERB to the wage subsidy and how to go forward uh, as the economy reopens? I think the important thing to understand was the wage, uh, sorry, the, the um, emergency response benefit was there to support people during the time, and is there to support people during this time of crisis when they lost their jobs because of COVID-19. They cannot work because of this pandemic through no fault of their own. 
and the government needs to be there to support them so they can continue to support their families, continue to pay rent and buy groceries. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit was created for the time when we were telling everyone, stay home, don't go to work, shut down your businesses, uh, keep your neighbors safe. It was there to replace revenue at a time where massive parts of the economy were completely shut down. And it serves and served its purpose extremely well and will continue to be necessary uh, until uh, we uh, move forward enough to get, to get to most people back to work. As people start getting back to work, as people start thinking about that link between employer and employee in businesses, small and large, right across the country, more and more businesses will start taking on that wage subsidy as a way of preparing and reopening. This is a natural progression of things from that moment of we need people to stay home and not collect paychecks to now we want you thinking about your job and reconnecting as different parts of the company, our uh, country, are reopening in a progressive way, uh, in a gradual way. So the transfer from most people on the Canada Emergency Response Benefit towards more and more people on the wage subsidy as the economy picks up again uh, is uh, exactly what we foresee and exactly how the system should work. Prime Minister Janet Silver, Global News. In mid-May, when we first heard reports um, that there was some fraud with, uh, fraud with CERB, you discounted the abuse, saying that it was probably just a few people among millions of Canadians who are applying for this benefit. But now you're bringing in legislation that will fine or imprison people for fraudulent claims. I'm just wondering what specifically changed in the last three weeks to change your thinking to push for this? Uh, the thinking hasn't changed at all. We always knew that the choice we had to make with the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was minimizing the amount of paperwork and verification up front so that it could flow rapidly to the millions of people who needed it. But we knew at the same time that there would be mistakes made, you know, good faith, honest mistakes that we would need to clean up afterwards and make sure that people paid back if they got both the wage subsidy and the response benefit, for example, and there's no harm, no foul on that if it's an honest mistake. But unfortunately, we also knew that, as with any system, there would be a very small minority, as I pointed out, of people who deliberately try to take advantage of the system. And we needed to make sure, we need to make sure that we have the tools to be able to assure the integrity of the system. People's confidence in their institutions, people con people's confidence in how their tax dollars are spent and invested, is really important. And people need to know that uh, criminals who try to take advantage of a system, particularly at a time where we're pulling together as a country, where we're looking out for each other, where we're supporting each other, um, is still important. So uh, we're making sure that, that we do have the tools. Hopefully, we will not have to use them very much at all because the vast majority of people are of good faith and just trying to support their families and trying to do the right things to get us all through this. But we do need the tools to go after those who deliberately choose to take advantage of people and systems vulnerability in a time of crisis. Hi, Prime Minister, Tom Perry, CBC. Uh, one of your MPs, Marwan Tabara from Kitchener, is uh, facing charges. He stepped back from your caucus. These charges date back to April. I'd like to know when you or your officials learned about them and what action you're gonna be taking. Um, as, uh, as we said, um, I and uh, my office uh, only learned about uh, the serious charges uh, against this MP uh, on Friday. Uh, no one in my party or my organization knew anything about them until Friday. Uh, and when we found out about these serious charges, um, the correct steps were taken for uh, uh, Mr. Tabara to remove himself from the Liberal Party of Canada caucus. Um, that, is, uh, that is the measure that we have in place um, and that is what we're doing. Okay. Uh, nous appris, uh, de ces we only learned of those serious uh, allegations 
on Friday as a party. Neither myself nor my office uh, were aware of that, uh, were aware of what had happened before that. Now, obviously, these are very serious allegations, and Mr. Tabara has uh, removed himself from the Liberal Party as uh, justice and takes its course. Is prepared to move ahead on body cameras. In your conversation uh, with, the, with the commissioner, was it you saying to the commissioner, this is something I want the RCMP to do? Was it the commissioner saying to you, this is something we should do? Where did the idea come from? Uh, it was uh, a conversation in which uh, it was raised as one of the things that people had been talking about, and the commissioner pointed out that there had been studies and uh, there had been pilot projects. Uh, there were concerns around the technology. There were concerns around uh, the logistics involved, uh, particularly in some of our more remote areas. Uh, and there were, of course, uh, concerns around uh, the financial cost of this. Uh, but uh, in that discussion, it became clear that those were sort of practical challenges that could be resolved and uh, that it was uh, probably an idea that's, uh, that's time has come to, uh, for greater transparency. But of course it is uh, only one measure amongst many, many things that we need to do to address uh, systemic challenges in this country to racialized and indigenous Canadians. Um, there are uh, so many different things that we need to look at as a country to uh, take concrete action on, and that is something that we're engaged with, uh, not just uh, our justice system, uh, but uh, with uh, Canadians, uh, with organizations, with uh, different advocacy groups, uh, to look at how we can take this moment uh, to bring real action forward uh, to transform this country for the better. Who raised it, sir? Was it you or the commissioner? Um, I don't recall. It was a conversation in which it, it, came, it came together, it came up. Merci beaucoup. C'est ce qui m'a fait la conférence de presse aujourd'hui. Merci tout le monde. That's the Prime Minister of Canada on this uh, Tuesday giving us his uh, daily update on his government's response to COVID-19. Uh, let me just tell you, though, if you are wanting to know what's happening in Quebec, uh, you can look online uh, at uh, the Quebec Premier, François Legault. He is with public health officials in Quebec City updating the situation in that province. Quebec making more progress today, 138 new cases in the last 24 hours. That's the second day in a row now the province has reported under 200 cases. If you want to watch that, you can go to cbc.ca and stream it live. But to uh, wrap up a little bit of what the Prime Minister said there today, let me bring back Bashi and David. Uh, most of the, I would say the vast majority of the questions were about the CERB, Vashi, and uh, the government's uh, legislation and whether it plans to extend it and how it's going to move forward with some of these measures. Yeah, what happened is parts of this legislation, which has yet to be tabled, were leaked to the media, and the parts specifically are in reference to what we heard so many questions directed at the Prime Minister about, and that is the CERB. That's the benefit that the government introduced months ago. It lasts for four months. You get $2,000 a month, and, and the, the idea was to get the money out quickly, and, and it did get out very quickly. The bar for receiving it, you know, you just had to sort of check off a box online saying, I, you know, I made more than $5,000 last year. I'm not making more than $1,000 a month right now. And then the money would be transferred through your CRA account very quickly. What this legislation sets out is uh, penalties and a process by which the people who have uh, defrauded the system or who have intentionally mm -hmm. uh, decided to apply for it and receive that money because it was so easy to access uh, are punished for it. Now the questions to the Prime Minister I think made a lot of sense because it wasn't as though the government signaled at the outset of this, you know, beware, there's a ton of big penalties coming your way if, if something goes wrong. And I, and I think that the, the Prime Minister was careful in his wording, and, and so have his ministers previously. And I think it's fair to say that they, you know, stress the idea that it's fraud, right? You're knowingly defrauding yes. the government yes. in this case. So it's not like you just made a mistake. I think the difficulty in a practical sense is discerning which is which, For right? Sure. Because For sure. a lot of people I heard of, and I'm, I'm I'm sure you did too. They were nervous about it, right? They were like, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if this particular thing makes me qualify or not, particularly, let's say, seniors who had made an income but also received a pension last year. Very worried about the possibility that they might not have access to this or, or shouldn't be getting it and they, will they have to pay it back? 
Uh, many times I've interviewed the Minister of Employment, Carla Qualtro, who really signaled this is not about punishment, and, the, and the, the Liberals took a lot of heat for that, actually, a few weeks ago, and some of our colleagues alluded to that in reporting through the National Post, which talked about a memo, for example, that went out saying, you know, don't stop payment, even if you think that there is fraud. Uh, and they insisted it's only a small segment of people applying, and we'll work this out on the other end. Uh, and, and the Minister had been very clear that unless there's, you know, malicious intent, they had no plans to do anything but ask for that money to be paid back. So I think that there are questions, obviously, about how this is going to work in a practical sense. Will the legislation be amended? The NDP in particular is very critical of the idea of penalties on the other side of this, and they also want the CERB extended, and the Prime Minister gave no indication, really, that that was their intent at this point. Obviously, yeah. they're trying to work out what it looks like at the conclusion of the program, which is coming up pretty soon, actually, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and how they transition away from it. But he certainly didn't say, you know, yes, we're going to extend it by four months, which is what the NDP explicitly wanted. I think that there is a discussion to be had about who actually will face some kind of punishment, uh, what that punishment is. Some of the details in the bill include, you know, thousands of dollars in fines, jail time, paying back double or triple the amount that you receive. So that is a pretty serious uh, cost to pay if you mm -hmm. are just, in fact, making a mistake. The Prime Minister was pretty explicit. You're not going to be punished if you're making a mistake. I think we need to see how that works in practice. Yeah, and I think the NDP's concern is that people uh, in a desperate situation yeah. uh, applied for it. Um, you know, maybe they shouldn't have, but they did anyway because they, they were very concerned about their financial well-being. Um, and now what could possibly happen? Yeah, I mean, so it's unclear. I agree with you how, how they go about doing that. Um, and it didn't sound, at least from what the prime minister was saying, that he believed it was a large number of people. But obviously, if people have uh, fraudulent taken uh, money that they shouldn't have taken uh, it, in any situation you would expect the government to go after them but it is as you said not exactly the same message that we've received throughout the past uh, three or four months David there were lots of questions too about a fiscal update which I found interesting because mm -hmm. um, while I understand the uncertainty in the economy I, I, I still uh, like my colleagues asking the questions think there might be some value in painting a picture of where things are it didn't really sound like the Prime Minister was inclined to do that yeah, um, just to go back to the Serb thing, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure it's as unclear as people think. I mean, there are two essential elements to a crime, the criminal act, <clears throat> excuse me, and the criminal intent. Uh, if you panicked and applied for all of the aid measures and got more money than you were supposed to get because you're economically desperate, there's no real intent there to commit a crime. But me, who people have seen on TV every day throughout this, I'm still working, I'm getting a salary. If I applied for the money to get the money because I felt I could take advantage of the system, I know better. I am committing a crime. Uh, yeah. So I, I think I should expect to be punished more than just pay it back. So I, I, I think once this is spelled out, I, I think that can become very clear in terms of what constitutes criminal intent. Because I think an economically desperate senior or a shift worker or a student who applied for something because they had bills due and didn't know what was going on and all the message was pay now, ask questions later. I, I, th I think it's pretty clear they're not going to go after those people. It's going to be people like you, us, who are working and have money and decided, hey, I can game the system because there's okay, no control. I didn't, I didn't apply for it, just for the record. <laughs> None of us right. did. Yeah. That's I, I mean, staying you, silent, you, you, which you, is you, her you, right. You, know? you, you, <laughs> might, you might be right, but I, I, I do think those people uh, yeah. need that reassurance. They need a public sure. reassurance that if they made the mistake or if they claimed it because they just didn't know that and those people will be And the Prime Minister said that in his yeah. answer, right? If you were yeah. panicked and freaking out and you applied and got more than you should have or should have gotten a different program than this we're not coming after you I, I think their whole philosophical approach with these programs is to put a floor under desperate needy people I don't think now they're gonna take a hammer and smash out the floor on the desperate needy people it's more the people who I, I think when you do the tax time reconciliation because all of this is taxable income you will get a very clear idea of who may have been playing games with the system and who you need the follow-up on now the other question you asked on, on the fiscal update uh, there are reports that finance is working on it uh, finance Finance may very well be doing that. It's the Prime Minister who publicly says there's really no need for this. And Bill Morneau has, has said that because any number you sort of put out there has to come with a massive disclaimer because sure. it's almost impossible to project economic activity with any rigor at the best of times, and this is certainly not the best of times. I mean, just look how wildly off the recent job numbers were in terms of what people were predicting and what actually happened. It just shows mm -hmm. a state of flux and volatility. So they could absolutely do a fiscal update to satisfy everybody to put a benchmark on paper and 
in good, good fiscal governance, they probably should. Uh, but people need to accept that a little bit like the modeling we've seen on the COVID mm -hmm, cases mm -hmm. and COVID deaths, it can change so rapidly uh, that, you know, it, it's almost out of date the minute it's printed and distributed widely. So, so that's the challenge there. There are a lot of questions on the economic consequence or the fiscal consequence, excuse me, of the heavy borrowing and the heavy spending the government is doing. You saw, you know, the, the Prime Minister and Glenn McGregor go at it a bit about the high cost and the debt servicing. Trevor Tome, who's an economist in Alberta, has done some, some pretty good work on McLean's today, if you want to go check that out. The $150 billion in borrowing, for example, uh, on the aid spending they've done, the interest rates for the government over 10 years are half a percentage point. Yep. So it's basically free. The interest cost on that over a decade yeah. is $7 billion. A lot of money for us, not a lot of money for a G7 economy. Yeah, I, I, I take your point. But given that it's taxpayers' money, it would be good to, for them to put out a chart so that we see all of that well, in there, one there place. There are you charts know? on what yeah. each program costs yeah. and what they spent sure. and what the uptake sure. is, how that all fits together. If you do that next week, you're having to do it again in September, again in October, or maybe I'll again do, in I'll December. Do it, I'll take it every week myself, but that, <laughs> that's just the kind of you gal I am. People. All yeah. right. <laughs> Thank you both very much. I appreciate yes. it. Fashion will be back at 5 Eastern. And David Cochran, thanks. Uh, just before we go, I want to squeeze in this quick interview because this was some good welcome news yesterday for people. Families separated by the Canada-U.S. border shutdown. Uh, the Prime Minister announced that immediate family members of citizens and permanent residents will be allowed to enter the country. And Ashley Cook is a doctor in Windsor, Ontario. She's very very excited because her husband's also a doctor and he works in Michigan and she happens to be pregnant so she's elated that this has finally happened. Ashley, uh, Dr. Ashley Cook, how are you feeling about things? Um, I mean, I'm pretty excited but I'm also a little bit nervous about actually attempting to cross the border just because I feel like there's a lot of it's up to the discretion of the CBSA agent at the border that is, there's a lot of questions for me that are like up for interpretation. So I'm kind of nervous to actually try to even do the crossing or so have him do the crossing. Have him do the crossing, right. So, so uh, when might he attempt this? When was the last time you saw each other? Uh, we last saw each other at the beginning of April because I actually was in the United States when the border shutdown happened. So I crossed back uh, shortly thereafter. So I haven't endured like the full three months like many people have, but it's been long enough. Let me say yeah. that. Yeah, that's still too long. <laughs> and and you are seven months pregnant, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I'm 29 weeks pregnant. So yeah, not much longer to go. <laughs> so what what is the what is the timeline then? When can your uh, husband get some time off and, and make his way over? That's sort of up in the air. I mean, I think for us, we have the question of whether he would be allowed to quarantine with me in the first place because uh last time he attempted to cross they stated that he would not be allowed to because yeah. i'm considered a vulnerable person despite the fact that i'm clearly interacting with patients on a daily basis but my husband is apparently a large risk to me um so uh, <laughs> i don't know but i i called so i called CBS, cbsa yesterday and asked them if this was still on their list and they could not give me an answer and that i should talk to public health so i called public health yesterday and then they told me they don't know if i'm on the list like you know pregnancy is a list of vulnerable people but they'll call me back in five business days oh they called gosh. me back fortunately and then they told me pregnancy is not on the list but they have no idea where cbsa ever got that list to initially tell my husband that so there's this big question and they said their general statement is that if you have an underlying health condition, which I mean, anything could be an underlying sure. health condition, how is it up to the CBSA border agent to determine what is a vulnerable condition in this case? Like what medical training are they having that allows them to decide what makes someone vulnerable to coronavirus? That, yeah, I, that, I don't know. I, 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 only have about, I only have about 20 <laughs> seconds, uh, Ashley. What, what, what do you guys, I mean, what will it be like when you're reunited? I imagine he just wants to feel your pregnant belly and see, make sure you're doing okay. Yeah, I think he's really excited about seeing me um, and really excited about seeing our dogs. So I hope that it happens <laughs> soon. And I hope it happens for other people soon, like yeah. not just people who are married in common law. Yeah, I do, I do too. And I hope it works out when he finally does make it to the border. Fingers crossed. Uh, thank you for talking with us. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, that's Dr. Ashley Cook in Windsor, Ontario. She is hoping to see her husband again soon. We are keeping an eye on coverage in Houston. Special live coverage of George Floyd's funeral from Houston starts in just a few minutes. I'm Rosemary Barton.
Marchand, Sue Hannah Marchand, thank you for joining us here on CBC News Network and streaming live right around the world on the CBC News app and our website. This hour, top story. We go to Houston, Texas for live special coverage of George Floyd's funeral. As you know, it's been two weeks since the unarmed black man died in police custody in Minneapolis after an officer kneeled on his neck for more than eight minutes. And since then, Floyd's name has become a rallying cry for change. His death has triggered worldwide protest against racism, against pr police brutality, including right here at home in Canada. George Floyd will be laid to rest in his hometown next to his mother. And the private farewell comes after public memorials in Minneapolis and North Carolina and also yesterday in Houston. So let's take a look live right now at Houston where that private funeral will begin this hour. People are still entering the Fountain of Praise Church. And let's listen in as, uh, you know, as there is music and, and song while people are getting ready to sit down. So this is unfolding inside the Fountain of Praise Church uh, in Houston, and there's another shot. You can't see it right now, but because of COVID-19 and the need for physical distancing, only about 500 people will be inside the service rather than the thousands as uh, place this facility usually holds. I can also tell you that Reverend Al Sharpton, and you've seen him talking about this death in the past, he's going to deliver the eulogy. We're also uh, informed that Vice President, former Vice President Joe Biden, the uh, nominee for the Democrats in the presidential race, presumptive, has taped a video message for this service. So here's a shot, a uh, different uh, and a wider shot from the back where you can see people as they enter and get ready to sit down in those pews. And this will be a service of high emotion. You've seen the protests around the United States, uh, into Canada, into Europe, and you've certainly seen the emotion, the violence, the chaos, and in some cases, it led to but here at this service, a few hundred people inside that facility. And CBC's Stephen D'Souza is watching all of this. He is right there in Houston. Stephen, what's happening around you right now? Well, it's interesting, Suhana. There were more than 6,000 people who came to the public visitation yesterday. Today, of course, as you mentioned, the private service. And so let's just give you a sense of the scene outside. You saw what's taking place inside family members, uh, clergy from around the country, friends, people from the community, all still filing into the church. And just over uh, here to the side, you can see just a sense, a slice of the media frenzy around here. People, of course, wanting to be a part of this moment, a moment that people here obviously describe as history. And just I'll swing around again over to the other side. And just to show you, you know, you mentioned it's a private service, 500 people invited. Just in the back here, you can see a number of people are trying to get in, and they've been trying to get in for a little while now, and it's not clear if they were already on the list or if there was a miscommunication. A few were just let in uh, just a few minutes ago, but it gives you a sense of just how important this moment is. For the people who are getting in, there's also quite a few people who are outside as well. There's an uh, gun, anti-gun violence group that's here as well, and just everyday uh, people from Houston who want to be a part of this moment, who want to be here because this is as much a celebration, but it's also about looking forward. That's what people tell us here. You know, they want to celebrate George Floyd's life, but they also want to look ahead to reimagining what America will be and what changes he will bring. So this service is expected to last about two hours. There will then be a procession to the burial site. And the last mile of the burial site uh, for that procession, the casket of George Floyd will be carried by a horse and carriage. And then that's, uh, that, that uh, ceremony will be private and he will be laid to rest beside his late mother. And so that will all take place in a few hours once things get underway here in Houston. And as you watch all of this unfold, and as I mentioned to our viewers, you are right there. Are you hearing comments from people? What are people in Houston telling you? It's really interesting. You know, we were in his neighborhood yesterday and talking to people who came to the visitation. And, you know, the Christian faith is such uh, an integral part of people's life here. Many see George Floyd as an angel, and they, and they see God.